Chris Grice, North Augusta, South Carolina. Chris was last seen outside his mobile home on Miller Street, November the 21st, 1985. His mom said she returned from work at around 1 a.m. and slept for a few hours before getting up at 7 a.m. to make Chris's stepfather's coffee before he went to work. She checked on Chris. She believed but didn't actually see him as his blankets were all pulled up and bundled and she just thought that he was cuddled up underneath the blankets. She went back to bed. A neighbor saw him at around 8.45 a.m. waiting on the school bus. Chris didn't have school that day and has never been seen again. He was outside with his dog and had no shoes on despite it being cold and wet. A search of the area showed no clues as to where Chris was, and to this day, his case remains unsolved. Um, if he had no school, and at 8.45 a.m., he would probably, the school bus would probably have already run. So was he actually waiting on the bus, or was he just outside walking around with his dog? I did find one more uh, thing on fandom. He disappeared November the 21st, 1985. He's been missing for 38 years from North Augusta, South Carolina. He was four years old at the time that he went missing. If he was in school, he was probably in, like, Head Start. And why would he have gotten himself up and gone out to get on the school bus? <clears throat> if his mother says that she went back to bed, would he not have gone in to wake up his mom? Um, at the time that he disappeared, he was 40 pounds. There's really little information. There's one photograph I found of him. He's a white male, and his name is Jeremy James Grice, but he went by Chris. Um, he vanished outside his family's home, and he may have been abducted. Chris was last seen just outside of his mobile home, on the morning of November the 21st, 1985. And it goes on to tell the same story. She went in to check on him and saw that the blankets were all bundled up. So she just assumed that he was underneath all the blankets. Now, if this was at 1 a.m. and a neighbor claims to have seen him at 8.45, then he probably was in the bed asleep when she came in. What happened... After he went outside, and, and the neighbor says they saw him at approximately 8.45, Chris was seen by a neighbor. He was standing by the mailbox with his dog holding his bicycle. He appeared to be waiting for the school bus to arrive. Strangely, he was barefoot despite it being cold and rainy. There was actually not any school that day. He hasn't been seen or heard from since. Chris's mother woke up again at 10 p.m. Now, it may, it may mean 10 a.m. here. I'm not sure. Chris's baby sister was crying. It woke her up. At this point, it became apparent that Chris was not at the house. Although, the dog that the neighbor had seen him with earlier, and the dog would follow him everywhere he went, was inside the house. His shoes and jacket had been left behind. After searching the house for him, Chris's mother contacted the police. Iron and ground searches were carried out and two ponds in the area were drained, but no trace of Chris was ever found. William Ernest Downs, a serial killer whose victims were all children, has been questioned in relation to Chris. He claimed that he had no knowledge of the disappearance and it is worth noting that he would have been a teenager at the time. Despite this, authorities are unsure if he was involved in Chris's case. Chris's family believes he was abducted by someone who lived in the area and that he didn't wander off. Um, Chris may have been wearing pajamas or he may have been wearing a t-shirt and jeans. He was barefoot. This story is somewhat similar. It reminds me of Kelly Holland 
a little boy from um, Knott County, Kentucky, who I did a story on, who his mother claims he went outside in the yard. There was no school that day due to a snowstorm, and he'd gone outside in the front yard to play. He he was also around six years old, and she claims that he had stayed outside all day long playing in the snow. And as it got evening time, she called him to come in for dinner. He wasn't around. She assumed he had walked down to one of the neighbor's homes to watch TV. And as it started to get dark, she walked down to the neighbor's home, and they said that he had never been there. And searches were conducted for him, and he's never been seen since. And this story just is, you know, um, similar to that. It reminds me of that. There are some age progression photos of him here. This is believed to be a non-family abduction. He would be 42 years old if he were alive today. Now, it was 10 a.m. I do want to go back and correct that. The other article said 10 p.m., which would mean that she slept the entire day and into the night. And That asked the question, where was the stepfather had he not come home from work? But it does say here that it was 10 a.m. The mother was uh, woke up by the, by the little sister of the baby crying. And she got up. So about an hour and 15 minutes or so after the neighbor saw Chris, she wakes up and finds him nowhere around. So did he come back inside the house and let the dog back in? Because the neighbor says that the dog was with him. So, the weather that day was cold and rainy. And a four-year-old child would, you know, not think nothing of going outside barefoot. They wouldn't, you know, think much of that. This next story is about another little boy who went missing, and this is from Massachusetts. The morning of August the 21st, 1976, seemed like an ordinary day. A 10-year-old boy named Andy, a 10-year-old boy named Andy Puglisi, P-U-G-L-I-S-I, -I, his four younger siblings and a neighborhood friend, Melanie Perkins, walked to the Higgins Memorial Swimming Pool in their town of Lawrence, Massachusetts. By that evening, all of the children were back home safely, except for Andy. The children and their friend lived near the pool at the Stadium Housing Projects on East Dalton Street. The pool was only 100 yards away from their home, where the mother lived with the children and her boyfriend. An all-day admission to the pool was only 15 cents, and Melanie Perkins later described the pool as a place where everyone hung out if you lived in the projects. Andy's mother, Faith, had told all the children to stay together and be home by 3 p.m. Although Andy's brothers and sisters all went home when they were supposed to, Andy stayed behind at the pool with Melanie. Years later, when she was interviewed as an adult, Melanie recalled feeling uneasy that day. A little later, Melanie asked her 11-year-old brother Jeff to walk her home. Once again, Andy stayed to swim and play. Melanie later stated that she had last seen him talking to some of his friends. At 3 a.m., Melanie was awakened by the police. They were there to question her and Jeff about Andy's disappearance. While not all of Andy's movements had been accounted for on August the 21st, the authorities confirmed that he called and spoke with his brother Michael at around 3.30 p.m. No one knows what all was said other than Andy was told to come home immediately. Melanie last saw Andy at 4.30, and a lifeguard saw Andy playing around 5. Another lifeguard working at the pool had the last known sighting of Andy at 5.45 p.m. At 6 p.m., Andy's mother was searching the neighborhood. The police were soon on the scene. 
Initially, authorities thought he might have run away. This was quickly ruled out, and de detectives began to fear an abduction. In the days that followed, members of law enforcement and more than 2,000 volunteers conducted a massive search. The National Guard and search dogs came in and combed the area around the pool, and they dragged the Shawsheen River and sent divers down to search for remains. The search continued for Andy for six days, but no trace of him was ever found. While the hunt was taking place, detectives were questioning possible suspects, including Andy's parents, Faith and Angelo. They had been married at a very young age. Faith was 15 and Angelo was 19. They had separated a year earlier, prior to Andy's disappearance. Both parents blamed the other for Andy's vanishing. Detectives questioned Faith's living boyfriend, Jerome Phillips. Phillips passed a lie detector test, and Angelo, who had been working in Salem, New Hampshire at the time, was also ruled out. Eventually, Andy's mother, Faith, was also ruled out. As the investigation progressed, detectives focused on a man named Charles Pierce. Pierce was living in Haverhill, Massachusetts at the time, and later admitted to abducting and murdering a young girl named Janice Pocket. During a subsequent confession, he also claimed to have abducted a young boy and murdered him and buried him next to Janice. Although Pierce couldn't give the boy's name, he did match Andy's description. To this day, no grave of Janice or Andy have ever been found, or any other, you know, boy and girl buried to, next to each other. Pierce was later accused of more than a dozen child abductions beginning in the 1950s. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison for Janice Pocket's murder, and he died in prison in 1999. Was he responsible for Andy's disappearance? Not everyone is convinced. In the late 1990s, Andy's friend Melanie Perkins began investigating his disappearance herself. She would eventually turn that investigation into a documentary. During her research, she was given a tip to look into a former neighbor named Gary T-H-I-B-E-D-E-A-U, Thibodeau. Thibodeau was a young man living with his mother in the same housing complex as Andy at the time of his disappearance. She discovered three reports that he had acted inappropriately with young boys. He had multiple drug charges, but he denied all of these claims. He had told the police that he had been at work when Andy disappeared, but officers were unable to verify his alibi. Many police officers believe that a man named Wayne William Chapman was most likely the suspect in this case. Chapman had been accused of sexually assaulting two boys he had abducted from a Higgins Memorial swimming pool in 1975. Chapman later admitted he had been in Lawrence at the time of Andy's disappearance but only at the local pharmacy. He never. He said he was never anywhere near the pool, he claimed. Two weeks after Andy's disappearance, Wayne W. Chapman was arrested in Waterloo, New York. In his van, police found Polaroid pictures. Police found Polaroid pictures of naked children, maps of the wooded areas around this area, a fake police badge, a starter pistol, duct tape, 8 millimeter movies of children, child pornography, high-end camera equipment, a child's bloody sock, and a rope. Shortly afterward, Chapman confessed to raping two boys in Puglisi's hometown of Lawrence, and according to one of the victims, who was later interviewed by Melanie Perkins, he, he says that Chapman was familiar with the area. Despite being considered a prime suspect, Chapman was not arrested or charged in relation to Andy's disappearance. 
police could not find sufficient evidence to establish probable cause. Well, today we know that they would test DNA on this bloody sock and rope and all the other things found in the van. In 1998, while conducting research for a documentary, Melanie Perkins met with two locals named Alan and Tony. They described finding a rectangular hole dug in the woods near the pool a year or two after Andy's disappearance. They were both just children. They described the hole as being perfectly rectangular with a flat bottom and flat sides. It looked like something had been removed, like a crate or maybe even a coffin. The hole was filled in a couple of days later, and neither of the two boys reported this until they heard about Perkins' documentary. Perkins added that she heard rumors about a, a hole being that the police had planned to dig in that area um, not long after Andy's disappearance. Now, if the police dug in that area and they dug something up and they found something, they never talked about it. They never came out about it. In 2007, a feature-length documentary, Have You Seen Andy?, was made by Melanie Perkins. It was broadcast on HBO and won the National Emmy for Best Investigative Journalism. Now, they're calling it an abduction, and, and if they believed it to be an abduction, they should probably be testing the evidence. Did they search through these pornographic videos and things to see if there were any images of, of Andy? However, both the bloody sock and the blood test later went missing. A Lawrence police officer had recently heard a psychic named Andrew Barnhart speak at a forensics convention. The officer claimed that Barnhart knew details of Andy's case and stated that Andy had been murdered by a man matching Wayne Chapman's description. Barnhart narrowed down Andy's burial site to a 50-foot area near the pool where he was last seen. Lawrence police officials refused to pay for Barnhart to visit, so funds were raised to fly him out twice. On the first trip, investigators were unable to find Andy's body or any evidence of any burial site. When he returned the second time, Barnhart spoke with Chapman over the phone, but Chapman refused to meet with him in person. Before leaving, Barnhart took several of Andy's personal items with him to help him focus on Andy. Barnhart never returned the items, and he was never heard from again. The investigation into his disappearance continued for months, and months became years. Now that has turned into decades. State police said that in 1999, one of Andy's childhood playmates, who had been at the pool that day, returned and this is the woman who made the documentary about him. She began to investigate, looking into what might have happened. Um, detectives on the case lingered on two men as possible suspects. One who had been charged with raping two boys he lured away from the pool in 1975. And another who had killed a young teenage girl. We talked about that person earlier too. Shortly before dying of cancer, the imprisoned killer of the Boxford teen claimed he once killed an unknown boy in Lawrence, but state police said that he gave few details, but the few details that he cut that he gave did not match Andy's disappearance. Wayne Chapman, who was convicted of raping two boys, was also convicted of sexually assaulting six boys in the Lawrence area in the 1970s. Um, he admitted to molesting dozens of children, and he was a strong suspect in Andy's case. Now, when we talk about Wayne Chapman, we have to mention that he spent a decade in a treatment center for predators, and he was deemed no longer a threat to children no longer a um, threat to uh, sexually assault children and was released back into the public. As well as another man who he had spent 10 years in this treatment center with, whose name was um, 
Nathaniel Bar Jonah, but he also was known as um, David Brown. Now, they were both determined no longer sexually dangerous by Judge John A. Tyranny, and they were released from the Bridgewater Treatment Center and transferred to Walpole State Prison to serve the remainder of... Now, this is Chapman, and he served, served the remainder of his sentence for the rape of two Lawrence boys. Now, Nathaniel Bar Jonah was released and was considered no longer dangerous. This Bar Jonah, or David Brown, or whatever his real name was, he had some writings. He did, he did these writings. He wrote, he was thought to have been not only a predator, but also a um, Hannibal Lecter type, who um, claimed to have um, cooked and eaten his victims, almost like Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, in 2000, Montana police arrest Nathaniel Bar Jonah, also known as David Brown, for impersonating a police officer. Now, this was something that he had in common with this Chapman. They were both known to uh, carry badges and impersonate police officers when they abducted children. Bar Jonah was a Massachusetts resident, and he was a known predator. He had been held at the Massachusetts Treatment Center for the rape of several children in the Webster, Massachusetts area. Twenty-one bone fragments identified as belonging to children are found in his garage along with several, with a list of several boys from a camp. And, and he claimed to have cannibalized the children that he abducted. And, um... He is considered a suspect in the murder of 15-year-old James Tita. Now, when they were searching his home for evidence, and they sprayed this chemical to search for blood and that type of thing, they found the name T-I-T-A written um, out. Uh, someone had written it out, and they suspect that it could have been the victim and he was a suspect in the abduction and murder of 15-year-old James Tita from Massachusetts. Now, he was charged with the rape of, um, of multiple children, and he was named a suspect in the disappearance of 10-year-old Zachary Ramsey of Great Falls, Montana. He was a known associate of Wayne Chapman. Now, in some of his writings, and this is what I was trying to get to and find, he had written about a child that he claimed to have abducted. FBI Behavioral Science Unit deciphers his coded written material. Like I said, he had made a recipe called Little Boy Stew and Boy Pot Pie. Um... Law enforcement believed that he cannibalized his victims. In one of his writings, he refers to a boy that he called Alonzo Puggy. Now, Andy Puglisi's nickname, his mother claims that he, some people in the family did refer to him as Puggy. His real name, his, his given name was Angelo Puglisi, and he went by Andy, but some his mother says that he did occasionally go by the nickname Puggy. Um, so, this is believe it's believed that this bar Jonah may have been responsible for his abduction as well. Now he dies in prison in two thousand eight. The author of three books on Nathaniel Bar Jonah, John Espy contacts Melanie to collaborate information about that he believes Barjona is referring to Andy in some of his writings. And in correspondence between Chapman and this 
bar Jonah while they were both incarcerated, he believes that he was referring to Andy in some of their letters. And this, there's a sick world out there, people. That I mean, when you think about it, you think about somebody being arrested for abducting or assaulting a child, you just kind of get the headlines of that story and then they're they're found guilty, they go to prison. You don't think about the networking that's going on with other predators. And we've heard about that in recent years. And um, I think it goes a lot farther back than people want to admit. Just like the story that I did, and, and well, not just me, but thousands of other stories out there about the boy in the box from Philadelphia. It was believed that the people who had him for several years of his life were predators. They were part of a network. They were part of a group of people who covered for each other and um, kind of took care of each other. It's believed that this is the reason why it took 60 plus years for them to identify him. In 2015, Melanie Perkins, the person who did the documentary, is contacted on social media by a woman who shares the story of a child who was abused by a pedophile at the same swimming pool around the same time that Andy disappeared, yet his name was, has never been mentioned. She, she searches the case and finds evidence that a then 18-year-old man was arrested just two weeks after Andy disappeared. He was convicted of raping two children who he often abused in the pool locker rooms. I wanted to wrap this video up by just saying I wanted to put the focus back on the missing child. Despite the fact that there were, it seemed like there were so many pedophiles and predators living and um, cruising around that area, this was before the creation of the internet. This was at a time when children were not being overly warned about strangers. Children were still going, you know, to walk to and from school and out to play with their friends. And this was around the time that the innocence of children was being just start, starting to be noticed. That, you know, children were coming up missing and these horrible things were taking place and I mean in this story alone I must have spoken about at least four different child molesters and predators in just this little small community and I'm sure there were more and it just you know it goes back to the point that I made earlier about how these people seem to kind of gravitate and network and kind of know where to go and um, I'm sure that they had some community we've all heard about these types of communities and I think the internet made it easier for them but the internet also made it easier for um, children to be lured because of games and things like that but but I wanted to get back to the story of Andy and then I'm going to wrap this up on September the 5th, 2021, individuals gathered at Higgins Pool in Lawrence, Massachusetts to honor the 45th disappearance anniversary of Andy Puglisi. Um, they dedicated um, a plaque to him at the pool and... Um, years later... The mother spoke. There's videos of the mother speaking on... Uh, there's a whole story about her. I may, I may come back and do a follow-up video on that because it goes to talk about her life after the disappearance of her child. And um, a lot of times you see parents who really become advocates and they go out and they create... Like John Walsh is an example. And this woman, she... Um, there's a story about her and her life after her, her son disappeared and what she went through. And um, 
there's an interview with his aunt. Now, I'm not sure if that's his mother or father's sister, but she talks about how the family very much believed that this Wayne Chapman was the responsible person. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children created an age-progressed image surmising what Andy might look like today. Andy would be 57 years old today. He is still officially a missing person, but he is suspected a homicide victim. His mother spoke about that, and she said she really believed that he was murdered probably within a day or so of being taken, possibly even within hours. Anyone with any information is urged to contact 978-745-8909. And that's pretty much where the case stands right now. There's so much more. I could have, I could have spoken for hours on these different players, these different suspects and their, their stories and their victims' stories. And this is just a very sad case. This families go through decades wondering whatever happened to their child. And hopefully one day the family has entered their DNA into databases in the hopes that one day remains may be found. Um, a lot of people do that on the, in the hopes that one day their missing loved one may actually be found. But... In this case, I think that the family came to the um, decision to, you know, accept that their child was probably dead. And so they just hoped that one day, if any remains were ever recovered, they might get, you know, some closure. Thanks for watching.